Good afternoon. Today I'll be speaking to you on supracondylar fractures of the humerus in children. This is the third most common pediatric fracture and the most common cause of litigation in pediatric orthopedics. It's also the most operated pediatric fracture. The common cause of litigation is missing or misdiagnosing it or causing an iatrogenic palsy or malunion during so it's important that we examine the child at presentation. The first look is very important. Make sure that with the elbow, you don't miss a lower radius fracture, which is common. Make sure that you don't miss a flexion injury, which is a different type of fracture which you need to address. Always look for the skin signs, such as ecchymosis or the pucker sign, or the medial spike, which suggests a difficult reduction and possibility of a nerve or a vessel entrapment. If there is contusion on the tip of the olecranon, this could be a flexion type of injury, and you should be aware of that. Test the nerves quickly. OK sign for median and ulnar nerve, thumbs up sign for the radial nerve, and if there is a pointing index, it tells you there's an anterior tortuous median nerve palsy. Palpate the pulse. If it is absent, you could use a Doppler to look if there is a waveform. If not, look for perfusion. The color is very important. Is it pink? Or is it thick? capillary refill, amount of pain and muscle activity will tell you about muscle perfusion. It's always better to have functional evaluation that investigation and pain is a very good guide. X-rays should be of good quality so that you make an accurate diagnosis. Look for subtle signs like the fat pad, the anterior displacement which tells you that this is a type 1 injury. Look for the anterior humeral line. Normally, it bisects the capitulum. If it is passing anterior, it's an extension type, type 1 injury. If it is posterior, then it is a flexion type of injury. Calculate the Bowman's angle. Make sure that you reduce it to normalcy, which is about 65 to 80, so that you don't end up with cubitus varus. That's very, very critical. The classification of Gartland, everybody knows, but you should know the outliers. The type 1 injury, which seems innocuous and can be treated in a slab. If there is medial comminution, which is type 1B, you might end up with cubitus varus and are likely to be taken for litigation. So these are deceptive. Look for the varus tilt and medial combination even in type 1 injuries and reduce them accurately. Type 2 need to be again carefully assessed and classified as rotationally stable or rotationally unstable. The posterior hinge may be intact, but there may be a discrepancy in rotation. So the type 2A is rota without rotational malalignment. Type 2B is with rotational malalignment. You can make out the difference by looking at the width of the distal shaft of the humerus. Compare it with the width of the distal fragment. That is called as Gordon's index. And if it is high, that tells you that there is rotational instability. Bach has given special subtypes of more than 10 degree obliquity in coronal or 20 degree in sagittal plane and has warned us that these are likely to malunite. So look at medial oblique or lateral oblique fracture lines and on sagittal, either an anterior slope or a posterior slope or a simple transverse. So there are various types of fractures is what you should understand. The transverse one, the lateral oblique one, the medial oblique one, the high supracondylar, the very low supracondylar, which may cause AVM. Also know about type 4 injury described by Leach, where anterior periosteum is torn and it's extremely unstable in flexion as well as extension. So when you flex it, it over reduces. So you have to joystick it. Reduction, everybody has his own method. Make sure that your OT arrangement is good. Conventional positioning on a large hand table with a small folded sheet below the elbow will allow you ease of reduction and pinning. That, that is how you should do it. But the problem is when you try to take a lateral and you rotate the shoulder, the reduction slips. So my technique is an armboard technique where I strap the proximal fragment with a white paper tape to the proximal board and then maneuver only the distal fragment and rotate the C arm to 180 degrees so that I get a true dead lateral without having need to rotate the arm at all. So this is how I reduce. And the ease of pinning is very good because I have the entire elbow to me for proper pinning. And this is how we do it. This has been published and it's available on JOCR as well as POSNA. 
why do we fuss about so much about reduction because if there is slight mal rotation it will collapse into virus so we should not accept a virus reduction and this is an example to show you the pillar configuration is very important it's not mal rotation but when it rotates it collapses into virus so virus mal union is not acceptable and you should be careful for that how do you confirm quality of reduction take oblique views on cm look at the pillars are they sitting on top of each other nicely and on the lateral view like the gordons index what is the width of the proximal and distal if it is matching it is good if it is something like this this is rotationally unstable and will collapse into virus and is not at all good beware of difficult reductions reduction where on internal rotation when you do lateral pinning it slips this is very common so what do you need to do the solution is rotate the proximal fragment into a lateral position and then reduce in that position so that you are reducing in lateral and reduction is then confirmed on the lateral profile itself so get the proximal humerus to a lateral view and then reduce it rotate the distal fragment and then lock it in flexion and pin if there is a anterior pucker sign a soft tissue block you do a milking maneuver so give gentle traction and milk the fragment from proximal to distal and disengage it and you will be able to get a reduction if there is a large swelling you can use the suction cannula method where you can make a small nick anteriorly suck out the hematoma and use that as a lever to push the fragment back against which you can do a reduction so this is the suction cannula technique where you can indirectly reduce and then pin it and then get your reduction and pinning again flexion type is difficult to reduce because of the nature of the injury it has to be reduced in extension but then difficulty is in pinning so how do you do it you use the transolecranon pin which is if you have a flexion injury you reduce in extension and then use a very thin 1.8 mm wire pass it through the olecranon into the medullary canal after reduction and then what you can do is since it is very thin and it can toggle intramedullary it is reduced under lateral then you take your ap correct the coronal mal alignment and then put a pin to stabilize the pillar and take out this wire which is transolecranon so then the wire is removed and then you complete your pinning so use the olecranon and distal fragment as a lever put a intramedullary wire and reduce it and then put the pins pinning pin placement has varied from cross pinning to lateral pinning and nowadays we prefer lateral pinning to avoid ulnar nerve complications this is safer and the configuration has moved from only two lateral pillar pins to divergent pins where one you have a four cortex pin to unstable situations where you can use three lateral pins so the four cortex lateral pin fixation is very important and you should be aware that this pin goes through the fossa but it gives absolute stability and is very very good for avoiding the medial pin so this is the four cortex pin when do you do medial pinning if it is unstable after lateral pinning or if there is medial oblique fracture pattern or comminution or impaction when you are doing it do it safely put the lateral pin first extend the elbow and put the from slightly antero medial to posterior lateral make sure you don't catch the sheath of the ulna nerve otherwise you can have a late palsy push the nerve behind with your thumb keep the elbow extended and drive the pin from antero medial to posterior lateral the pink pulseless hand look at perfusion capillary refilling and you can use a doppler what is the rational approach it is reasonable to monitor carefully a pink and pulseless hand after reduction for 2 days if the perfusion is good nothing needs to be done if the perfusion deteriorates pain worsens or there is a deteriorating neurological picture mandatory exploration is recommended so close reduction and pinning if it is pink and pulseless document the lesion by imaging watch for the three a's analgesics anxiety agitation and observe for 48 hours if there is a deepening median nerve lesion imperfect reduction or deepening ischemia explore adapt to your local circumstances what about nerve injuries usually they resolve do reduction whenever possible and observe usually they will recover 90% of the times when you reduce if you feel there is an interposition or a mushy reduction then explore in an open fracture obviously you explore the nerve 
and if you have created a nerve injury post pinning immediately remove the pin and revise if it is unstable if there is a pink pulseless hand with a nerve injury then have a low threshold for exploration thank you very much for this lecture and i thank pcmc for giving me this opportunity and i invite all of you to attend the international fractures in children symposium on 8th 9th and 10th of july in pune and please register as soon as possible supracondyle fractures always hit rather than miss and do a good job thank you very much